Hi guys. Well, if you've stuck with me to the end of chapter 25, I guess you're making the whole plunge with me as we start to wind down a little bit, heading into our final three chapters. Heading in next to chapter 26, Mother of God Boomerang. When we're going to get a little deeper into the Amarakari Indian Reservation, the communal reserve, as they call it. And we're going to start out with a quote from a Shintuya community board member whose name I did not catch. <clears throat> I do not understand why we are forbidden from extracting lumber. We no longer have any lumber left in our community, you know, the village of Shintuya, and we can't get any more from the reserve. I do not understand why we are forbidden, while others from the outside, meaning Hunt Oil Company, are not. Why do they say the reserve belongs to us? And this is the uh, crux of the problem among any. But anyway, this is, we're going to start over and uh, start out at Monday morning, July 20th, 2009, in the uh, little Indian village of Shintuya, Peru. The Celestine prophecy level of high strangeness and synchronicity and salvation did not begin and end with my run-in with Moose Mulligan. The day after I laid eyes on my favorite planet eater, he and I were discussing real estate investment in the Peruvian Amazon, an idea which appealed to the tree hugger in me and the dynamite fisherman in him. At approximately 11 a.m. on Tuesday morning, I said to Moose, if I can find a decent-sized piece of land on the Madre de Dios, hopefully with road frontage for 20 grand, I'll buy it. It was not 20 minutes later that I was settling onto a park bench in the town's derelict little plaza to start putting my moose file into some kind of logical order. I had not been there for five minutes before a total stranger stopped to talk to me. He was an elderly gentleman, perhaps 70 years old, walking his dog. I really was in no mood for company, particularly company that did not speak English, which would have been anybody in Salvacion except moose. So, I was none too happy when he sat down uninvited on the bench beside me and, and introduced himself as if I gave a shit as Tello. This is an honest-to-God, fairly accurate translation of the conversation I had with Tello on that park bench. Gringo, are you looking for some land to buy around here? Well, that depends. Where are you selling? I have 100 acres of land on the road to Shintoya. Is it on the river? Oh yes, it has about a half mile of frontage on the river. It also has that much frontage on the road and a couple of little houses. And how much do you want for it? At this question, the guy wrinkled up his brow, rocked back and forth on the bench and did some silent figuring in his head. He leveled his gaze into my eyes and announced, I want $20,000 for it. <laughs> Six days later, on a hot and sticky Monday morning, Tello and I were tromping around together on what could be, any time I wanted, my very own 100 acres of land on the Mother of God River. The land to my surprise, even came with a built-in income from a working banana and pineapple operation on the property, which would have been a great thing had I wanted to be a banana and pineapple farmer in Santa Cruz, Peru, 
three miles upstream from Shintoya. Unfortunately, I did not want to be a farmer in the Mother of God. I wanted to be a tree hugger, and as far as I could tell, after three sweaty hours of traipsing around the logged over wasteland, there was not one tree over 12 inches in, diam in diameter on the entire 100 acres left to hug. I guess I left that small detail off my real estate investment wish list when I ordered up the place from Spirit, who was obviously taunting me by giving me exactly what I had asked for within 20 minutes of my asking for it, just to see how I would react. It was a tough choice, but I politely declined Spirit's offer and asked Tello if he knew of anywhere for sale that had any big trees remaining. You're not going to be able to find any big trees anywhere near the road or the river anymore, gringo, Tello assured me. There may be a few left way off back in the mountains. He pointed in the general direction of Amarakari but any trees anywhere near the road were cut years ago. I thanked Tello profusely for all his hard work and promised I'd pass along the information about his place to my gringo friends, which is what I'm doing if anybody wants a 100-acre banana farm on the Mother of God River in Santa Cruz, Peru. Drop me a line and I'll set you up with Tello. I offered him a $300 finder's fee if he could find me anything for sale with any big trees left on it and began my three-mile trudge with my bag of cannonballs down the hot, dusty, and logged-out road to Shintoya. Staggering into town, 90 sweaty minutes later, I stashed my bag of cannonballs in the woods behind the totally empty lodge. I mean, there was no sign of even a desk clerk or a maid and set off in search of the person in charge. Two hours later, in mid-afternoon on a Monday, I found him passed out asleep on the floor of his dirt floor hovel with his topless wife nursing. What if my quick senses was correct, their fourth child under the age of six that shared the 12 foot by 12 foot shack. The nice fellow opened up the lodge for me and asked me to sign the guest registry. Under comments, I wrote in, hunt oil, go away. So I asked the fellow, what do you think about hunt oil moving into your village? It's muy bueno, he said, smiling. Oh, shit. <clears throat> Besides shopping for real estate on my spiritual journey to kick Big Oil's ass out of the Peruvian Amazon, the other purpose of my visit to Shintoya was to meet with Ramon, my native guide into Amaracari, who is supposed to lead me to the ancient Inca ruins in less than two weeks. Since my last meeting with Ramon more than two weeks earlier, Spirit had started to hammer some sense into my thick skull about this ridiculous pipe dream adventure. The final nail in the coffin had come in the form of a bizarre email I had received while in Salvacion from Bureaucracy Number 1. Remember him? The outfit in Puerto Maldonado that had seemed fine with me going into a Maracari a month or so earlier. Here is the email in its entirety verbatim. Sam, the information that you are providing is very helpful to all of us, but putting forth your own ideas and initiatives by yourself without further previous coordination also holds risks that can be fatal to what we want to achieve as an organization. 
please consider that the information you are gathering can very easily filter through to the wrong people who you might not know well enough, something which we want to avoid. Take into account that you are handling extremely confidential information here, and we ask you to consult with us any step you want to take with us first. An expedition into the reserve in order to encounter and document the evidence of an archaeological site on the Colorado River requires previous consent of the communities with Puerto Luz in particular as people who know the site are from there and we have detailed reports on what conditions to expect. Uncoordinated action will create conflicts between the communities and individuals. There also exists a possibility that in case the presence of a foreign informant is discovered by the Peruvian government, the government might take actions of repression with the argument that there is external intromission in the demands of the indigenous people for the respect of their rights, and it might discredit the indigenous people's struggle for their territories. We are grateful for your concern about the subject, but at the same time, we want to avoid you becoming an object of attacks by the company, Hunt Oil, and the government. Close quote. <clears throat> the English translation of this message from Bureaucracy Number no. 1 had been written by one of my top secret behind-the-scenes gringo informants. You guys don't know half the intrigue I've endured down here, who innocently and inadvertently had mentioned my trip to the ruins to the bureaucrats. Later, upon returning to my hotel in Cusco, I had a note from the guy saying, I request that you pretend you never met me. As a foreign resident, I am particularly vulnerable to any form of repression which might or might not take place in the future, and at this point, nobody can really foretell how tough things are going to get here. Okay, dude, whatever you say, I never met you. Coincidentally enough, I bumped into Ramon in the dusty main street of his little native village. He invited me back to his house to talk. By Shintuya standards, Ramon's place was a downright mansion, three rooms in the main house, a detached bathroom with shower and flush toilet with a seat and plans for a new addition. In fact, with a little more work, the place will be as big or bigger and about as fancy as my own little farmhouse back in Texas. This guy was clearly on the ball. Before getting down to business, which you never want to do in the Peruvian Amazon without a bit of social intercourse as segue, Ramon brought out a stack of photos of his ancestors from the Amara Kerry village where they used to live, perhaps 10 miles east of Shintoya in the middle of Hunt Oil's seismic exploration zone. The sepia-toned faces stared out at me from the yellowing paper like ghosts from another time and place that had about as much connection to modern-day Shintoya as a pterodactyl has to a pigeon. Sitting there in my plastic chair at Ramon's Formica table, I thumbed through the images of a tribe of proud warriors directly out of the Stone Age. 
my naive tree hugger heart somersaulted right back into the most shameless noble savage fantasy you could imagine as I stared at the most striking image of all. Staring right back at me was the spitting image of Ramon, dressed in nothing but a penis sheath and a wild mask of feathers protruding directly from holes in his peered face, crying out to me of the true depths of the tragedy the white man, usually in the name of Jesus, had inflicted upon this proud tribe and so many others like them. Okay, I admit it, under all this tough talk joking about the greedy, money-grubbing Indians, beats the bleeding heart of a hopeless lefty romantic. There was no doubt in my mind that the proud warrior in the photo, who I assume was the village shaman, was Ramon's distant ancestor. The portraits <clears throat> had that air of vintage photos from the U.S. from the 19th century of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and all those guys, usually dressed in Western clothing, so I assumed they were roughly of the same vintage. I asked Ramon when they were taken. He wasn't sure, but he estimated they were taken in the 1970s, just a few years before he was born. Another wave of tragedy rolled over me. That dude with the feathers poking out of his face was probably Ramon's grandfather. The loss, the utter, tragic, senseless loss. Ramon pointed out the spot on the map where the photos were taken, the place where his tribe's village used to lay. It was near the sacred singing rock that Patrice had mentioned to me from our toilet paper thrown in the back of a truck. The sacred rock was called Amana. Like the ruins, it sat there like a helpless moth trapped in the web of Hunt Oil's seismic lines, waiting for the spider bites of the 12,000 sticks of dynamite heading its way. I decided that a trip to Amana made much more sense than the death-inviting expedition to the ruins. Ramon said that the trail was probably going to be tough going as nobody, as in not one person, had gone back to visit the sacred site in well over a year. I guess radios and CD players trump a lousy sacred singing rock any day. We decided on a scaled down one week round trip to Amana beginning July 28th. This would give the intrepid real estate investor and spiritual pilgrim a few days to run down the river to Nueva Eden, New Eden, to check out an eco lodge for sale down there and be back in time to squeeze in a trip to the sacred rock before running off to Bolivia to deal with some visa shit to do with my passport. Perfect! Business out of the way, Ramon and I returned to our little chat about his ancestors who had so recently left their lives in the forest that had sustained them for thousands of years to follow Jesus and Coca-Cola into the cell phone age. I couldn't believe they would just abandon their jungle home after all those centuries living there. Nobody lives out there in the forest anymore, Ramon assured me. Nobody, I said, trying desperately to hold on to my fleeting noble savage fantasies that had flared up after seeing the photos that were taken about the same time as the infamous Life magazine article. Why not? Well, because they all moved here to Shintoya, he replied with the same it's a toy boat, exasperated tone of voice I had heard from the harem boot native woman on the bus. Well, how about you, Ramon, I said. Wouldn't you like to live in the jungle again someday? 
Ramon flashed me a white tooth smile, humored by the fact that the naive gringo in front of him just plain did not get it. I like to visit the jungle because that is where my family came from, but I like my table here. He slapped the Goodwill cast off for Micah dining table for emphasis, and my chairs, and my television. <clears throat> Depressed by the shabby, lowest common denominator decadence of the poverty-stricken village, I stopped inside the tiny village store to pick up some ramen noodles to cook for dinner. By far the most appetizing thing for sale, and some pineapple juice to mix with my vodka back in the lodge. Arriving back at the empty lodge with its indoor plumbing and showers and flush toilets and double stainless steel kitchen sink and four burner gas stove, no doubt the gas being supplied by Hunt Oil Company, and sleek dining table and comfortable mattresses and plump pillows and warm blankets and iron sheets and mosquito nettings and pots and pans and dishes and silverware and riverfront privacy. I smoked a bowl, sipped my drink, and enjoyed the quiet twilight from my comfortable seat. As I sat there with the pleasant buzz flowing through my brain, thinking how nice that soft mattress was going to feel after my long, hard day of real estate shopping, all I could think about were those poor, deceived, innocent, naive Indians. What the hell were they thinking when they packed up their penis sheaths and feather masked forever and left their ancestral home in the rainforest to follow the white man to their new plastic bobo filled paradigm? I didn't know whether to laugh, cry, or scream, so instead I comforted myself with a second pack of double chocolate Oreos and retired to my soft bed to read Becoming for more tips on how to get this revolution in consciousness that is going to save this planet up and running until lullabied by the frogs and the crickets I drifted off to sleep. Tuesday, July 21st. There was just one little snag there always is in the Peruvian Amazon and my scaled down plans to visit the sacred singing rock. All my shit I needed for the camping trip was back at Manu Learning Center almost as far back as Salvacion and on the other side of the Mother of God. I had been hoping to spend a few quiet days in Centuria at the lodge catching up on my writing, but now Spirit was putting me back on the damn bus to go chasing down my other bag of cannonballs. So at the crack of dawn I was out of bed and packing up my first bag of cannonballs, which I stashed under the bed, I climbed on to the same bus back to Salvacion that I had climbed off of the day before. Will this revolving deja vu ever end? Make that two snags. Hopping off the bus on the one blistering hot day I have ever spent in the Amazon jungle, I plunged down the rocky path toward Manu Learning Center, the same one I had climbed out of only just eight days before. The problem was, due to the fact that the trail was so rocky, there were no footprints to follow. A half hour after beginning my hot hike, I was hopelessly lost and had no clue how to find the trail to the lodge. Judging by how hot and sweaty and miserable I was, and I was walking downhill carrying nothing, it was plainly obvious that I was never going to be able to carry my second ball of cannonballs, which were stuffed into a rucksack, not a backpack, 
up that damn hill anyway, sweating and cussing and slapping flies, I turned back around and hiked back up the hill to go find some local guide to show me the way to the lodge and to carry my fucking bag of cannonballs back to the road for me so I could be saved by a truck to take my stranded ass back to Salvacion to my hotel and I hoped an ice cold beer with my buddy Moose whose company I almost missed after two days away from the Planet Eater. Some little old man about 20 years older than me and 20 pounds lighter than me who I found in his front yard taking advantage of the rare hot sun to dry a bunch of coca leaves offered to save my miserable gringo ass for the equivalent of seven bucks and I jumped at his offer. Off I began a second time to follow the guy down the plainly obvious trail to the lodge that I had walked right past coming and going 15 minutes of screaming and yelling like wild banshees finally caught the attention of the pecky pecky captain who cranked up the motor to come ferry me across the mother of God. For the last time in my life, I walked up the steep stairs to Manu Learning Center where the invisible man was, once again, completely ignored by the click of eco-tears sprawled out in various angles of repose in the lounge's comfortable furniture. I hefted my heavy bag of cannonballs over my shoulder the best I could manage and was ferried once again over the mother of God. The little old man wrapped my rucksack in a sheet and somehow wrapped the sheet around his forehead, thereby balancing my bag of cannonballs on his back with its weight pulling backward against his head. It hurt me just to look at the guy. He plunged into the narrow ford full of slippery rocks like he was walking across his yard. I had to race just to keep up with him as he nimble-footed his way out of the river canyon and back to the road. I thought of Marino chasing those peccaries through the jungle, leaving me in the dust. I had a minor panic attack imagining trying to follow Ramon, who was less than half this dude's age, to the sacred singing rock. Who the hell was I kidding? The old dude had barely broken a sweat by the time we got back to the road while I was about two steps away from heat stroke. I found a tiny spot of dappled shade along the scalped road shoulder, meager protection from the broiling sun that I augmented with my umbrella, and there I sat on the hot shoulder of the road for more than two hours, sinking deeper and deeper into a classic, what the fuck are you doing with your life, funk, until a logging truck heading headed toward Salvation Sawmill with its load of fresh corpses saved my stranded ass. Climbing into the 10 foot high bed of the truck, I ripped the only decent pair of pants I had left. I arrived back at the Shayla to find Moose surrounded by a whole pack of planet eaters from Hunt Oil who were in town to meet with the Shintuya natives the following day to figure out the cheapest and easiest route to rip them off and push them out of the way of their helicopters and dynamite. Moose was nervous. Moose was nervous, standoffish, and reserved around me. Listen, he said to me nervously, I'm kind of surrounded here by all these big shots. I won't be doing any partying tonight. Damn, no partying and salvation with my planet-eating buddy. Somehow I managed to fill my time without Moose's company and crashed into bed at 9 p.m. And we are going to break this chapter here because I'm afraid I'm burning my brownies. Come back for this chat part two in just a minute.